So, in this part of the workshop, we are going to have the roundtable discussion on the mostly socioeconomic aspects, and for that, we are going to start with a presentation by uh, Dr. Hamed Fodusi, who is joining us on the WebEx from Vienna. Uh, Hamed is an assistant professor of finance at the School of Business at Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. He's now traveling in uh, Vienna, so he's joining us on WebEx. Uh, he is going to give his presentation on Ormiaric restoration, some economic insights. And then we'll open up the panel for discussion with Hamed and how Hamed, please. Thank you, Anja. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so delighted to be part of the event and uh, so happy to see old friends all around the table. Uh, Hamid didn't mention that I'm also originally from Urmi. I grew up in the same city and I spent my childhood enjoying the swimming in the lake. So I have sort of a personal connection with the lake. I even spent my first year of life in a small village looking over the river of the, of the lake. Uh, so I'm very much personally connected to the issue and so uh, passion for helping the restoration of the lake. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly offer a few insights, uh, mostly from economics perspective. And I, I'm sure I won't have time to go into the details. I'm just going to highlight the few outlines. And then during the Q&A session, probably we can open up first. There is an interest for further details of the topic. So if I can, uh, all right. So let me position my discussion because Throughout the discussions yesterday and also today, we, we heard a lot about the complex, complicated systems. And the way I see uh, the economic modeling discussion within the framework of the complex system is the following, that we usually start with a very complex system, which to some extent is a seemingly complex phenomena because we don't know enough about its different dimensions. And I believe if we apply proper modeling uh, approaches, we can reduce the complexity by better understanding agents' behavior, bringing it back to the framing of the problem and arriving in a less complex or hopefully a complicated problem that we can tackle uh, with more standard methods. So what I'm gonna do over the next couple of minutes is trying to offer a couple of issues that may help us frame problem a bit differently using economic insights. And the tools I'm going to use is a standard toolbox of an economist. So I'm just quickly going over Econ 101 principles that probably will be used during my talk. So first, we believe in trade-offs. We believe that the resources are limited. So every action basically means not taking another action, and there's an opportunity cost for that. So we have to think about trade-offs. The second, we strongly believe that people respond to incentives. Uh, uh, people's behavior is not chaotic. They behave according to certain behavioral rules. The third one is that relative prices are important because they send signals to consumers and uh, investors. And the fourth one is that institutions and property rights matters. So my discussion will be based on pillar, theoretical pillars of those four principles. And the way I see it within the dialogue of a complex problem is that we start with some economic analysis, we fit it into the discussion and the decision-making process, we probably will face with new questions that should come back for further analysis. And the cycle runs over and over until we reach a consensus after making a thorough dialogue and discussion of the topic. So let me go and offer. So we are talking about ecosystem restoration. In this particular case, Urmia Lake restoration. And restoration, from my view, is basically, it consists of two major actions. First of all, it's reallocation of resources. We are going to take resources from certain sectors, which in this case would include agriculture, would include some public funds, which can be used for other purposes, for health and education and others, and we're bringing them to restore the lakes. So we need to think of the cost-benefit analysis framework to make sure that what we are doing indeed works following the plan. And the second uh, dimension of it is the redistributional impact. By any intervention within the basin of the lake, we are going to have some winners and some losers. The winners might be the local community, the owners of the recreational facilities, etc. The losers might be part of the farmers who have to pay extra charge for the irrigation water. So we have to identify these two dimensions, the cost-benefit dimension and the winner-losers analysis or the political economy of the situation. 
And at a very, very high level, abstract level, I see the restoration problem in particular for this lake as an optimal control problem with the free terminal points. And I emphasize on the free terminal point and I elaborate in uh, a few minutes what do I mean by that. So we start with an initial condition which is very undesirable. We all know, we agree that that's not the situation that it should be. But what I'm not sure is what, would, what should the new steady state be? And what, what I mean, I mean the size of the lake after the restoration when we reach the, the end of this project. Basically the question is, what is the optimal size of the restored lake? Should we restore it to its original maximum size? Should we restore it to half a size? That's a question that I try to read reports and analysis that exist. I found less of answer to this particular question, but what's the curve of values uh, for every extra meter of restored lake? That's the starting point that as an economist, I want to see. I want to see what is the value of a saline lake, in particular in this particular case, Urmia Lake. And when I'm thinking of the value of a saline lake, I can think of multiple components, constitutes, but in, uh, as in, just as an example, without going into the details, I can think of four major dimensions of the value for a saline lake. The hedonic dimension, which is the pleasure of landscape and the cultural heritage around the lake. The productive one, which in this case would be salt production and artemia production. The ecological or, I'm sorry, ecological or ecosystem perspective, which is the preservation of biodiversity and also the prevention of salt storms. And finally, the recreational values, the ecotourism, swimming value, health tourism, and so on and so forth. So first thing I want to see is how do we value the lake? What is the approximate estimated value of the restored lake under different size regimes? And as can you see from this graph, some of these components are size dependent, meaning that if we restore it with a larger size, the value of these components would be larger. Some of them might be size independent. For instance, if you're talking about recreational or swimming value, maybe a lake which is restored to its half size still provides more or less the same value to visitors. So we need to have this schedule of the value of the lake. At the same time, we need to know the value of the alternative uses of unrestored lakes. So if we just decide not to restore the lake, what's the outside option? With the current situation, how much value we can get? We can mine the salt, we can start new ecotourism probably in the region, etc. So the, the value of the restored lake would be the difference between these two values. And I think it's important to have at least some rough numbers on the total value before we, may, we start talking about the full restoration. And a cost-benefit analysis is lacking the other period if we don't talk about the cost schedule. So the other thing I want to see is the, the, the cost curve of restoring the lakes. So uh, using the standard graph, I emphasize the value of, ha of having a supply curve of water, saying that if we, graph, uh, if we plot a graph which shows the quantity of water from different sources, which are rerouted and injected into their lake, what's the marginal cost of each of these options and what's the quantity, uh, uh, the volume that we can bring in? Usually in these uh, efforts, we usually start with certain activities, usually a low hanging efficiency measures, which, have a, which usually have a, a negative marginal value. It means that it pays for itself. When, once you run the efficiency measures, it not only helps the lake, but also saves money in other aspects. But as soon as you pass that initial uh, positive sum uh, region of the curve, you start moving to other components which entail some cost. So we need to know that if we start doing structural engineering or if we want to pursue agricultural reform transfers from other basins or even use more innovative climate engineering, what is the value of water from each of these sources? Then I can put together the supply curve of water next to the valuation schedule and then we can talk about basically what is the optimal terminal point for the lake? And what is the optimal path of restoration? And by the optimal path of restoration, I mean the speed of adjustment. Should we restore it in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years, 100 years? So these are different regimes of restoration and each comes with different costs because the speed of adjustment would be different. And when we are talking about the valuation of the lake, there are also challenges with the valuation, I understand that. 
because the consequences of the, uh, the current situation in the restored case would be distributed over large temporal and spatial scales. It's, we don't know the geographical boundary of the effects, and we don't know over how many years the effects will show themselves. But that's a challenge that I, I endorse and I appreciate it from the beginning. We also have, we are facing the, the issue of lack of sufficient knowledge about what would happen if we leave the lake at the current situation because of known phenomena in that ecosystem valuation, things like tipping points, unknown consequences, or even option value of preserving the lake and turning into another use in future. So because of these, we usually adjust the estimated value of the previous graph with an additional value to correct for the ambiguity that we face when we're talking about the complex system like a lake. Once we come up with the estimation of the value, we need to also, as the next step, map this value to each of the lake stakeholders. So the value doesn't go one by, two, one, one by one to each of the stakeholders. If you look at like a range of different continuum of stakeholders, starting from local community to going down to international institutions and global environmentally concerned citizens, you can see that the direct impact is going to be weakened as we move down the list. So the value is not the same. For someone who is living very close to the lake, the value is different than an Iranian citizen who visits the lake maybe every couple of years. So we have to come up with a table. What's the value of lake after restoration for each of these uh, stakeholders? Then we can talk about the, their willing, willingness to help us rescue the lake. I think that this was the discussion we had yesterday. Dr. Zarghami, I guess, made the good point that the question of are you willing to, to, to save the lake is not the right one. We should ask how much are you willing to contribute to save it? And this contribution comes first from the valuation. If we can know the contingent valuation of lake for each of the stakeholders, then we can come back and uh, back up it with the, uh, the, the value that we are offering and think of the financial ways to uh, do the investment. So, that's the first set of information I think that we need to have, and I think we don't have it yet, so it would be great to get this overview, macro valuation reports produced by the uh, Preservation uh, Council of the Lake. The second set of information I'm going to provide is some background information on the basin's economy. So I started reading a little bit about the situation, and I wanted to make sense of the problem for myself, so I wanted to see about which context are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, provinces which are very poor compared to the national averages, or provinces which are doing relatively well compared to the rest of the country? So I collected, as much as the data availability permitted me, I uh, collected a couple of key indicators, and I'm including here East Azerbaijan and West Azerbaijan. Kurdistan is also part of the basin, but it's smaller shares, so I'm focusing on these two key provinces. So in, in terms of unemployment rate, as you can see, both provinces are doing better than national average. So we are not facing a severe employment uh, crisis in, do, in these two uh, provinces. However, this um, relatively well uh, performance of the employment market comes thanks to the large contribution of the agriculture sector of the region. So if you look at the share of the agriculture in the regional GDP of the two provinces, you can see for West Azerbaijan, it's 20%, almost 20%, which is almost the, twice of the national average. West Azerbaijan is not an industrial region. It's mainly working on based on services and agriculture. East Azerbaijan is different. East Azerbaijan is one of the most industrial regions of the country. There are large manufacturing companies there. That's why the share of the agriculture and GDP and labor force is smaller compared to West Azerbaijan. Going down to the share of the agriculture and local employment, again, you see that in West Azerbaijan, 30% of the people are working in the agriculture sector. National average is 20%, very similar to what we have in East Azerbaijan. In terms of rural household income, you can see that the West Azerbaijan's rural household income is significantly larger than the national average. Again, similar to previous indexes, the East Azerbaijan is pretty much the same as the national one. In terms of the urban households, though, the picture is different. East Azerbaijan is overall a wealthier province, but the rural population in the west part are wealthier than the east part. This is probably, I'm guessing, because of the successful agriculture practice around the basin of the lake. 
Um, looking into more specifically to, to agricultural activities of the basin, I, I kept hearing the discussion of including farmers in the discussion and using the social ties and local community solutions. Let's first look at the numbers. We are talking about 500,000 farmers in the region. I look, the approximate number is 500,000. So we're not talking about a small village of a couple of hundred households. We're talking about 500,000 households with a population of approximately 2.5 million because the size of the family in this region is around 4.6. The average farmer income is 13,000 US dollars. And compared to the minimum wage of the country, which is 3,000 US dollars, you can see that the farmers in the basin are doing pretty well. And if you compare this 13,000 US dollar average farmer income with my previous number, which is the average rural income, you could see that it's almost three times of the average rural income because the rural income includes all the rural population, those who do cattling and labor supply. This is only the farmers of the basin who use this irrigation water for producing agricultural products. And the cultivation area is also 4,600 hectares, going up from 335 in four decades ago. So here comes a very critical question, that with these prospect numbers, can we easily convince farmers to switch to an alternative plan? I heard yesterday that the Kava was saying these farmers are not subsistence farmers. Exactly, they are not subsistence farmers. They are wealthy farmers. They are doing pretty well. And when you're talking about large stakes of four times of the minimum wage of the country in the rural region, which has a lower living cost, convincing 500,000 people to switch to an alternative way, uh, uh, way of living, I don't think it's an easy project. We should keep it as one of the big challenges uh, ahead of the restoration. Then I went into the micro pattern of the agriculture. I think by now everybody knows that part of the problem is probably due to a switch from um, uh, wheat farming and grape farming to apples, and which resulted in larger water footprints of the agriculture sector. So again, I wanted to make sense of the details of this process. So I collected numbers on the water footprint, the yield, and the price of these three major crops. So wheat and grape used to be the traditional uh, crops uh, cultivated in the region, and the apple was introduced late 70s, and it revolutionized the, the rural economy of the region. So look at, let's look at the numbers. In terms of water footprint, uh, the cubic meter per ton, wheat takes 1.8 thousand, uh, grape takes uh, 2.4, apple takes 800. So apple is actually a much more efficient uh, crop uh, compared to the, to the other two. In terms of yield, the yield of apple is 40 compared to the other two. So the, the farmer gets probably three times more than grape and more than six times more than the, what they could get with, uh, from the uh, uh, wheat. In terms of price, these three are the same. So what we can see is that by switching to apple, the, the income of the farmers can go up with a factor of six, seven to three times compared to the older pattern. And when you calculate the water footprint per calorie, Apple comes actually as a very, very good uh, uh, choice. So the question would be, should we really abandon apple farming? Because with the economy of the uh, water footprint, apple is actually not a bad choice. Then in terms of the strategies to convince farmers of apples to switch to alternative, there are four major uh, alternatives proposed. The higher efficiency scheme, which is trying to increase the efficiency of irrigation. The, the problem with the efficiency is the well-known rebound effect, which says that once you increase the efficiency of the water, the farmers will expand the cultivated area through major channels. They may increase the area itself. They may change the plantation pattern from uh, rain farm to irrigation. Uh, they may change the crop choice, and they may do double or multiple cropping. How we can address this? There are multiple strategies to deal with that. One would be to enforce the land level constraints saying that the no new area can be cultivated, so we have to limit it. The second would be the, the crop level constraint, not allowing people to start cultivating the water intense crops, the aggregate water use schemes and water pricing schemes. Let me more quickly move to those. Uh, the second initiative proposes the land conversion, which asks farmers to stop cultivating. I think this is a very problematic solution. 
because it depends heavily on government commitment to continue paying this uh, no uh, cultivation fees. And with the history of the government, I don't think people would believe that this solution will continue for a long time. The third one is the water use management. So right now we have a de facto prior appropriation water right that the farmers believe that they have the right to have free water. We're going to transform it from a free one to a priced one or a capped one. And a prerequisite for this is being able to monitor the water extraction. And I, I read a little bit about the existing monitoring technologies. I learned that the engineering sector in Iran has developed several solutions for precise uh, monitoring of extraction from different wells. So instead, we have made a big progress on that. The, the details of the proposal consist of multiple schemes. One is a cap and trade scheme, which was proposed that you give a maximum extraction uh, capacity to the region and then let the farmers trade their quotas. The other one is a crop-based water tax. You tax farmers based on the water intensity of their crops. So you don't tax the, the intake of the water, you tax them based on what they produce. The third one is a re revenue recycling scheme saying that we will link the payment to local farmers by the level of the lake. As the lake level goes up, we adjust the payment to farmers so that we internalize the positive externality of uh, saving water in the agriculture sector to the farmers. And the fourth one is the water tenure reforms to attach a particular right to water to the land the farmers own. And the fourth one is the crop change. I am skeptical about this because I don't know where we can go from Apple because Apple, as I said, has a very good water footprint and it produces a relatively good economic outcomes for the farmers. I don't know what would be other alternatives which can cover the large vast area of uh, the, the basins of the Umia Lake and still has a better water uh, footprint and provides a sustainable economic incentives for farmers to join. So to conclude, I think uh, I was thinking of what are the requirements for implementation. I think one thing we are missing are this micro-funded uh, micro agriculture and water models. I was trying to see, to simulate the reaction of farmers to changes in the water rights. I realized that we don't have these models in Iran. These are the models which simulate basically the crop choice decisions of farmers based on different parameters. And they come up with a prediction of what would they choose given the new water price, new tax credits, input prices, labor, et cetera, I think we have to develop one for the Urmia Basin to be able to run scenarios and basically uh, see the reaction of the farmers. The second thing we need to be concerned is the financial engineering solutions, where we are going to get money for all these projects we are talking about. So I made a short taxonomy. I think I won't have time to go through all of them, but I think we need to use a combination of public and private uh, partnerships, uh, tax and exempt uh, Ulmia Lake restoration funds, international donors, et cetera, so we can discuss it later during the panel. And finally, I'm concerned with the political economy of the restoration. So the project is a long-term project. We are talking about 10 to 50 years of uh, restoration efforts, and these long-term projects are usually subject to political cycles. We know that the politicians change their behavior as they get close to the election and then they start changing, walking away from their promises. The second threat is similar to what we have with the climate change discussion, that the physical outcome would be visible. People would see the level of the lake, but the economic impact would be very intangible or hard to measure. People may start questioning the, the spending of a vast amount of money to restore the lake. So that could be another challenge after a couple of years, they may give up continuing it. The project is going to create a large amount of rent seeking and market distortions because you're going to move the, the, the business and livelihood of people. They're going to change uh, the value of uh, 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 land, properties, etc., close to the river. And still we have the problem of common pool with the underground water, which needs to be considered. So to conclude, sorry, I think I went a bit uh, above the time. So we need to talk about the optimal size of the restored lake without Having the schedule of the optimal size, I think the discussion is incomplete. Oh, we have four options for agricultural irrigation reforms, but they have their own challenges that we will talk further. We need a modeling tool to be able to predict farmers' reaction. We need to open a dialogue about the financial engineering solutions and be concerned about the political economy of the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamid, for your great and very informative presentation. Uh, I would say it was 
very comprehensive and at the same time concise. So at this time, we will open the floor for panel discussion. Uh, feel free to ask or comment on anything related either to the Hamid's presentation or in general about the uh, socioeconomic aspects of the Urumir Lake restoration program. So I see Professor Bish Saniel uh, raising hand to ask a question. Uh, Professor Saniel, please. Okay, uh, Hamid, I will repeat the question. In your very beginning of the presentation, where you showed a slide when you choose, which you identified on the left hand side the deep uncertainty and unknowns about the about the problem. And then you had an arrow that says model and then based on that some answers. What struck me is how can you model if there is that level of uncertainty about the problem? Okay. If you're talking about that one, so my point of view is the com part of the complexity is because of the lack of knowledge. Basically, it, it seems complex because we haven't tried enough to model and use standard behaviors, uh, 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 archetypes, to sort of reduce the degree of complexity. So to me, if I can think about, let's say, the reaction of people in open pool problems, or if I, if I can see the reaction of people to tax schemes, to credit schemes, to changing the price of water, to changing the price of crop, these are old models that, to me, reduces the degree of complexity from a mess to a predictable behavior. So I can take out that components and reduce, first of all, the number of chaotic behavior in the system, and second, have prediction on the part of the system. And that's the strategy I think we need to, to, to go. Instead of being, uh, being completely passive about the complexity, we try to basically cut the complexity by bringing in people from different disciplines, ask them to offer analytical modeling uh, ways to sort of uh, reduce these dimensions of complexity and finally co come back, come up with something that we can manage. Close to December now, so he called National Weather Service that, look, uh, what is going on? What is the prediction? He said, no, I think it is almost certain that this year it will be very cold. He said, how do you know? Because do you know all the Indians are collecting woods? So that is what it is. So they're collecting woods now. That is the way scientific prediction works. So how do you combine this local knowledge and scientific knowledge and who is feeding back to whom is not clear? And that is essentially the problem of uncertainty. And this type of uncertainty we cannot resolve. So that brings us back to our reframing question. So this is a question that was raised in 1951. A, by a PhD student, not a lot of your PhD students here, so it's very encouraging. His name is Kenneth Arrow. Kenneth Arrow got Nobel Prize for his PhD thesis. And he wrote something called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. I'll, I'll just read it because Amurtha Sen did it in his Nobel Prize year. So this is what he said. I, I just want to just read it so that I don't make a mistake. Arrow had elegantly demonstrated that short of dictatorship, Social choice procedure could not always generate unambiguous and consistent outcome for a group of rational individuals who had their own preference ranking over collective outcomes that simultaneously meet a set of reasonable conditions. Very scientific, but what it actually means when you have competing groups, agriculture user, urban user, farmers, if you give them rational choices, they cannot come to a solution that is consistent. Universally true. So he, he thinks this is an impossible objective to achieve. That means in Urmia Lake, that problem simply cannot be solved by rational choices. So that means a complex problem. That complex problem can only be solved by the people who are interested in, by their own decisions. So they have to argue. So this is what in water diplomacy we are saying there. You have to bring in stakeholders and let them decide what is best for them. It is not win-win, it is not win-lose, it is what is best for them. They have to decide, then only you can get a solution. If that is the framing we work, use, then I go to Ilona Ostrom. She talks about three rules. And those are the three rules that we need. What are the three rules? 
first rule is the constitutional rule, meaning that at a very high level, I should decide on certain things. In this case, I would say that yesterday we said that equity and sustainability, these are the two high level rules. They have to be respected, irrespective of what we do. Second one that she talks about is called collective choice rules. Those groups in Urmia Lake have to come up with the collective choice rules. Third one is the operational rule. How actually that water will be used at an individual formal level. Those are the operational rules. These three rules have to come in some type of synchrony. How that happens? So the way it can happen that the people at the farmer level should be able to decide on their own rules based on their own benefit. If that mechanism can be created, then you have something useful. Otherwise, we will go back and forth and get thoroughly confused. So what is beautiful about Ostom's Nobel Prize is that she is allowing these individual level people, operational rule to be dictated by the people who are affected by them. So it's not the Iranian government going to decide. Iranian government decided the equity and sustainability level. Farmers should decide really how they should use water, how much they should pay for it, whether they should be given incentive or not, that can be coupled. So what I argued, Lydia, and then basically encourage us to think really, how do I create those three levels of rules? One at a very high level, another at the collective choice tool level, which is maybe at the Urmia Lake level, another at the farmer's level. If we can do this, perhaps we can reframe the question and start addressing it a little bit more effectively. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Shabi. Um, other comments to people who might offer? So I have Steve Henry, but this is a letter. And it paid off. Yeah, uh, I want to address uh, the first actually uh, uncertainty that you raised about the scientific uncertainty that was also discussed yesterday about the model. That yes, the, the model cannot do a good job for seasonal forecast. Grant. And I mean, I, I will just refer to the quote by I think Corey Fox, Fox that all the models are wrong, but some are useful. So I think we should just <laughs> yeah, and and I do believe in that. But so we should. We should ask the right. I am. <laughs> I am, but that's that's why I, I have to be honest about it. But um, but we should ask the right question from the model to get the right answer. If the question is, uh, I want to know the uh, the amount of rainfall ten years from now in January, this is the wrong question. Okay. At least as of now, the knowledge is not there. But uh, if we ask the, the this is I, I want I'm trying to frame like one example of a right question that we, we can ask from the model. If the if you're looking at the output of the GCN, the global climate model that has been run for the whole uh, 21st century, for different scenarios okay, that uh, we are all familiar with, different scenarios of the greenhouse gases from the uh, most extreme to the uh, then the science fiction one that actually reduces greenhouse gases. Then the model have their, they generate their own weather and climate and they have their uh, own variability. And they can tell us that if under that scenario, there is a trend of reduction of precipitation or temperature or all the variables, if it is uh, reducing or increasing, but they cannot tell us at like year of 2085 January what's going to happen but the trend is reliable because the boundary condition for the model is manipulated it's described that comes from uh, the forces that some of them the uncertainty is very little in, in it such as the solar radiation and some of it is just prescribed such as the greenhouse gas right so we just impose that to the model and we want to see the response and if like 20, over 20 models that uh, Sarush was also talking about yesterday, they pretty much have a good agreement that there is a, uh, let's say, decreasing trend of precipitation over a lake or near basin, then we can kind of rely on that. At, at least that, that raises a flag. So we know that, okay, all the models agree on, on that. And if the temperature, which is 
there, there's more agreement on that. If the temperature increases, so these two together, that can that they can imply that uh, they are both favorable for reduction of the size of the economy. So I think that that would be a right question or right expectation from the model. You look at the trends that they suggest and look at all the models and see the uncertainty within the model. If they suggest a uh, projection with a uh, small uncertainty and they have a good agreement, then we can rely on that uh, result. If not, we will also acknowledge the uncertainty and say, okay, we don't agree and we, we cannot rely on that. I thought that would be good to just comment on the uh, ability of the model to discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Looking for higher level uh, uh, findings from the workshop. You take it back and then Talked yesterday about uh, being purposefully pragmatic. And I'd like to suggest something from a slightly different uh, standpoint. And that is uh, from my experience as a government official implementing programs and how you integrate what happened today is you have to go back and do things. And there's been a lot of very interesting discussion, um, some of which might be very helpful, some of which might be interesting and exciting, but are not doable within the framework of what your authorities are or what your reach is. Um, and in one respect, I think it's helpful to consider um, reflecting on the narrative. Um, and the narrative that we have had, for the most part, uh, understandably, is a very uh, pessimistic narrative. And I want to go back to what I said yesterday, glass is half empty, not half full, change the glass. How do you change the glass here? To some extent, you change the glass here by acknowledging what you have accomplished. And there's been very little discussion of what you have accomplished, except for statements said yesterday about, you know, you don't have to talk down to us. We're very smart people. We've done a lot of things. That's true. Uh, we heard this morning about a whole bunch of uh, projects that are underway, divided into four categories about areas that have been considered. And if you look at those projects, and then you look at the considerations, they somewhat mirror what we came up with. So all I'm suggesting is, is you might want to look at what you have accomplished and, and take credit for that in a going forward basis, consistent what we, with what we have suggested. Um, I'm from Romania, and uh, my parents were generation by generation, so I was growing up there, and uh, I agreed to Adam at the same I followed all the presentations that they did in my history. I just wanted to say that um, the idea of educating the locals, especially the farmers and the rich, in the in the Bunya and the region around the, the lake is very very important and I think that um, it it should they should be educated about this problem with very very simple language very very simple language it's not like they, they don't need to see the charts and stuff like that very complicated way in a very complicated way. But just now, during the break, I was talking to Dr. Janine here, and uh, I was saying, well, there's the rainfall is completely different now from 20 years ago because I'm living, 
I was living there. I know that there was not much snow during the winter right now in India. But um, and she said that the dry up of the well cannot be just because of the rain drops and because of you know uh, the use of the under underwater resources. So I would say that as a local, I do know that. So it's just a simple fact that are really, really simple, but the locals don't know about it that much and it really help. And I have another comment, but this is a little more political than social. <laughs> uh, but I don't know, I can add later. And thank you so much, Jim, for your nice moderation, and uh, we are so proud for that. Uh, my findings is that we should reduce the farming and the agriculture, and also we should increase the irrigation efficiency. In our recent uh, findings, which is based on a system dynamics model, to restore the lake, there is no solution rather than going to reduce the farming. And we should then educate the people, go to create new jobs, and then move the people to the new jobs and rather than agriculture. It is something against uh, what Hamid said, but Hamid got to see. And uh, uh, as I believe that income of the people are not so high as he said, and also, the apple also uses more water, and it's not a good choice for future. I mean that we should reduce the number of the farmers, educate their children to find new jobs like services, as already done in the U.S. And also, the, another issue is that based on uh, we talk together, we need collaboration between the remaining farmers. To, 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 to create new annotation and improve the current farmers' entities, we say in Iran, we should increase their powers and ability to negotiate with the government. And uh, to again, to, to come back to the policy issues we need, neutral water diplomats in the region, neutral water diplomats. By neutral, I mean that to be able to make trust among the stakeholders, to have the ability of facilitating the negotiations, and have a knowledge about the area. We cannot bring people from India or South Korea or US to, to negotiate the mediation. We, we, we should go to the, our university and train new young people to be water diplomats in that area. And also, they should have not no personal interest in negotiation. And also to be patient, you know, because sometimes I talk with the, our friends in the MIT and I say to them, do you want to come back to Iran? They say that, no. I am asked why, and they say it's difficult to come to that area because there are some bureaucratic issues, there are some, and I say that this is a problem of developing countries, and you should come back to solve these issues, which is some part of the problem. And if you wish that, if you reach the airport and somebody will come to give a key for you, this is your apartment, this is your car, 
you should focus about that. And then finally, regarding the policy issues, we need new generation of water diplomats with those characteristics. Thank you. That's also a good question. Um, uh, honestly, we are now in the face of the U.S. something like 1970, building dams and channels and something like that. But however, EPA and other environmental stewardship organizations has worked in the last 30 years at here, and we need the experience of them, how they in incentivize people, how they educate the people, we, we should not go so high. The right air under MIT, you see the station for the bikes, okay? That people, you, I, I, I know that you also use the bike to come here. But sometimes in Tabriz, I was using the bike to come to my office. A day a student come to my office said, okay, Dr. Zaghami, we love you, but however, it, it is possible to don't come with the bike because we are shying about that, that you come with the bike, please come with your bicycle, with your car. And uh, this is some cultural issues that we should think and work on that to change the culture and I just want okay. to say, I feel bad that I just want uh, talking too much, but I just want to focus our attention to something that happened, uh, like with Yunard comment as well as I got several emails yesterday night from other people. I just want to share this so that we can focus our direction some way. And we had this conversation yesterday. I think when we are trying to do this, I think one thing is very important for us to see. What Leonard, I think, very rightfully pointed out, we just cannot talk about negatives. I think we need to show the politician that certain things have happened, and these are good, and it can be built on from there. So this is a good point, I think, to raise. Then Jeff sent me yesterday something that was quite powerful, and it was passed in the Iranian parliament on mm -hmm. June 29th. They are claiming, and I read it really from his email, is that we have yeah, used yeah, expert fine. views of more than 500 academicians and 50 other experts, and 25 bills have been passed on June 29th in Iran. So that means things are already happening. We have to see really how we can plug in there. If we try to do something independently, it's not going to work. So that means they've already passed 25 bills, and they're going to save 1.7 billion cubic meter of water. I don't know how, because we could not even agree what the water balance is. So that means there are a lot of uncertainties there. Then, David Sherman, he sent something, he said, although it was not clear, but his sense was that our Iranian friends know what the uncertainty is. They're not probably telling us fully. So what I would encourage you to tell us is, look, in your mind, where is the key source of uncertainty? We are talking about the Rudmir Lake as a problem, farmers is a problem, but where are the key sources of uncertainty? If you can help us maybe articulate those on the board, then I think we have something that is useful. I think can be done from there. That's all. Thank you. Yes. About your question, I think the main thing for us is seeing the uh, the field areas of the uh, your country. This experiment is very useful for us in the own leg or four leg. I think we have to increase this type uh, work. It was very useful for us. What about the uh, other things that uh, Dr. Zagam said when I want to say about this? I think we have to change the direction from the agriculture to the industry and make more job opportunity for the farm. I think this is the only way. And uh, we have to uh, use from 
uh, useful methods for uh, reducing water for agriculture. Uh, I think there is no way for increasing the or developing the agriculture. So already we develop a lot of agriculture. We have to, uh, I think, reduce the, uh, this type of work and we go to the industry direction. These two points, uh, the increasing change of field visits and uh, yeah. the uh, decrease in more detailed case study analysis, as well as the agriculture. Uh, it, 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 it's a bit hard to you know, start off my uh, morning. I was in this meeting. Uh, I think I can separate you know, the discussion in two parts. Those that we uh, have, uh, they have interested for us. And that part which relates to the government. In case of farmers, uh, the main thing to have their contribution is to somehow explain what they will gain from such a collaboration. It is one of the main sources of understanding. And I think, you know, not in case of OMIA, even in Great Salt Lake, that I saw it, we will have such a, you know, ambiguity. I told you yesterday about the successful exchange in the basin that you know, one of the uh, satellite wetlands was restored by the farmers. But they gained from it. It was not only because of you know, uh, serving to birds or you know, one or four others. They gained from it. So uh, please consider that you know, whatever we suggest should somehow can be, you know, sensitive performance at what they will do. Another issue is that when you are talking, you know, about this huge base in like four million with five thousand fifty two thousand square kilometers and five uh, as Hamid mentioned, five hundred thousand farmers. It is really hard, you know, to organize such a you know huge and huge companies. I think uh, the, what you referred to Professor Olson, she suggested to start with some small communities and then extend it. And maybe this is one of the ways that we start with some, you know, some small community and then extend you know, our scope of work. But still, you know, really at this stage I have problems with tell you what can I tell to the farmers as a you know positive you know, impact of restoration of the economy on their life. You know uh, I told you, you know we have uh, we can have some salty beans, we can have some dusted stones, da, da, da. but uh, really it is not enough. They have to you know so whatever you can suggest us that how we can Farmers, uh, while they inter interact and come and collaborate with the government, that can be very uh, useful and helpful. And just uh, remind you that there are 500,000 people. Uh, I think, you know, in case of you know, government part, as uh, also I mean mentioned, we are having, you know, uh, we have, I think, three official organizations that somehow uh, are officially, you know, uh, manage and organize water, uh, you know, in Iran. Ministry of Energy, uh, Agriculture, and to some extent, Environmental Department. And when you come to lower part, then MP is more member of, you know, Parliament, some local communities, they have an official impact of the management of the water resources. So, if we can have a 
uh, was some uh, uh, what is government if we can define a new you know framework for the water governance and how we can you know incorporate this into this uh, this can be very helpful uh, so uh, uh, these are really you know uh, big issues you know some social politics issues that uh, I feel you know uh, can really can help us to for this form and the like or from engineering part uh, yesterday I mentioned you know, how we have uh, indicate impact of human activities and climate variability on the you know, status of human status of the lake. I know uh, there are some criticism about the result and solution. We're not very angry with that. But I think this was the first, you know, quantified work, engineering work, work that tried to distinguish impact of these two, you know, factors and uh, influence. It can be helpful that if I my colleagues in MIT can do the same work and we can take on the data and really can have some feedback from your side that what is based on your methodology, what can be the uh, you know, role of anthropogeny and the uh, planning variable. Also, as Dr. Mohada mentioned, there is a you know, lack of information uh, at the end of the uh, guiding station before you know, the lake and what really reaches to the water body of the lake. We have you know, lots of you know, uh, gap of data between the end of the station and water body. I think, you know, Dr. And the hobby and this thing can also help to us, helpful for this issue and to help us what really reach to the uh, water body of the lake. Uh, Hamid uh, suggested a very good economical model to uh, indicate what is the optimum size of the lake. I showed you yesterday a work that we have done that if you reduce the lake or the area of the lake, how the economical services of the lake can change. I think this is also a very good uh, work that we can do with our colleagues here together and uh, to work on it. However, I know there are lots of you know, objections about reduction of the uh, lake area. Uh, I'll take this opportunity you know, and I hope that I can uh, arrange such a meeting in Iran, and as you also came here to invite some of the people from here, I think you know if they be there and invite the then they can you know they can more realistically suggest you know uh, the uh, possible work that we can do to improve the status of the village. I think I thought that this was just very valuable. Now um, I have lots of hands. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Tomlin first, and then I'm going to go just uh, what we call uh, clockwise, which would be a uh, uh, vision show. Uh, uh, and then uh, 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 we'll do the grand conclusion. And then uh, come in, we're also in the clockwise <laughs> arrangement. Let's skip an hour. Offer your ideas on knowledge exchange priorities. Uh, on sustainable agricultural uh, development, uh, productivity efficiency in Urmia Lake is very below. Uh, in this area, for each cubic meter water consumption, only 0.2 kilogram product crop. In this time, important uh, notice to water virtually and water footprint sense. Hello. Exactly. 
again. Uh, I say uh, beside unsustainable agricultural development, productivity efficiency in Urmian Lake is very below. In this area, for each cubic meter uh, water consumption, um, only 0.2 kilogram product corrupt. Important in this time, notice to water virtuality and uh, water footprint sense. Urmia Lake uh, has a huge uh, crisis about water limitation, but uh, this area each year uh, export large amount uh, water uh, with uh, corrupts uh, that uh, product uh, low efficiency. Water productivity and virtual water analysis that involves the uh, trade in the data that's out there. Thank you. Those are really good points. Uh, thank you. I, I have to thank you, Jim. I, I first of all apologize for not being here yesterday. And I know that many of these issues were covered yesterday, so that's, um, I could only come today. And I want to say, first of all, I'm very, very uh, thankful and glad to see this delegation from Iran here. It's been our hope uh, to build a very good relationship between the two countries. And the person who helped me is my doctoral student, Babak, who, through whom I'm beginning to just understand a little bit of Iran. So I have a long, long way to go to understand Iran. But having said that, let me just say my first reaction to this hearing the presentation. One was that I think there are a number of factors that we think are plausible reasons that ultimately affect this outcome. But we are not totally sure exactly how they are linked, of their intensity. And I think we should be humble enough to, to acknowledge that we don't know exactly how to, how to explain the problem. We know the symptoms. And since we don't know how to, how to exactly explain the problem, I think there should be experiments in terms of understanding the problem. And the 19 projects that Leonard Nelson mentioned, that all the efforts that you have made so far, I think evaluating from those efforts, evaluating in an interesting way, which one worked, which one didn't work, which one worked halfway, should be a research project. That, a very good, interesting evaluation. And evaluations, I would bring in the idea of organizations, not just the outcome of whether water level went up or down, but what kind of organizational setup led to better outcomes. And in this organization setup, the local, which came up again and again, and which Eleanor, Eleanor Ostrom's work was mentioned, one of the assumptions of Eleanor Ostrom's was that local communities make their own rules. They don't need either state, government, or they don't need market, right? They make their own rules. Now, I think that we don't know if that, that's the case that's going to, going to work in the case of Iran, that you can say it's just the local community. But I do think that the idea that we have to go and teach them how to be productive, how to be efficient, was exactly opposite of Wastron's idea. Ostrom's idea was that they know because they live close by, they are very aware of what works, what doesn't work. Yes, they do make money out of the resources, but they also know how to collectively protect them. Right? So it's a very interesting idea about how do we include them, and how do you learn from them, and how they explain the problem, because they just deal with it at a local level. So I think that the issue of um, of administrative arrangements in which the government, local government works with these groups, maybe with some central government support. What kind of arrangements I think are best, are most useful? I think these projects, these 19 efforts that we have on the ground, we could learn from them. And so uh, so I'll, I would put that as the highest part of the research, research agenda. One last thing I'll say about Hamid, because Hamid mentioned this thing about the trade-offs and uh, it's, it's just for a, for, a, for, a, for a argument. My impression is that the way neoclassical economists think, and I think Hamid 
falls in that same category of the argument. Or there are efficiency, there's equity, we have to make trade-offs. My, my understanding from working in India, uh, which is different, is that the, the way we think of trade-offs is not the only way the world can be operated. And it is not true that efficiency and equity are always have to be traded off. Actually, innovative policies are often policies that transcend trade offs. And if that's why you are able to create political consensus instead of creating either or. And I think that that again, that uh, if you start with that idea that there are trade offs that have to be made, I think we already give in half the story. This speaks to Shafiq's point about value creation and so on as well. Ashok, you're next. Thank you. Um, it's connecting to the Professor Sun who's uh, trying to understand. My, actually, as a peace and conflict researcher, I mean, I'm more interested uh, what we are talking about, about whom. Who are the actors involved here? I think there is a lack of, uh, I mean, we have been discussing one and a half day. Uh, Two times the farmers are coming, farmers are coming in a, a scale which is uh, not properly understood, for, at least for me, because uh, farmers are not exactly the farmers of similar type like we discussed yesterday. I mean, who are the actors? Is this the farmers or the other, uh, like uh, people those who are uh, in the navigation, the fishers community, or the other people those who are not farming? What's happening there? But more than that. And I think we haven't really talking about that about the regional dimension or the group dimensions there. That's because rather than just providing an economic um, cover for all these groups, I think there are two other significant groupings which we need to bring it to the discussions, and that might complicate the matter when we go for any kind of. Uh, Mediation. I will come back to mediation, but, uh, but how that will really work? Who are these people? Those who are the stakeholders, the real stakeholders? Because whenever, if there will be a change in the way we have been using that water in that area, there has to be a conflict. Of course, conflict is not necessarily bad, but how that conflict will be managed? Who are the actors we are going to deal with? And then coming back to this, because yesterday Sophie was mentioning about mediation. Of course, I didn't do the homework. In Sweden, we don't get the homework, you know. So, but, but, the, uh, but the thing is, if, 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 you, if, you, if you do the mediations, but what kind of mediation we are talking about? Because this is an internal issue, mostly an internal issue. But the internal actors that you are involved, whether, because also Madhi was talking about the mediations, which will be like kind of people that you are not, uh, they don't have any stakes in it. But if you look at the mediation literature, there you, you have to be a successful mediator. There has to be also a strong um, interest involved, because otherwise we just provide a space. So what kind of mediation we are talking about, at what level? And because here, this is much more complicated, because it's an internal issue. Uh, and whether it's a mediation, or we are providing a facilities, or what exactly needed what needed and the, what sort of level in that kind of conflict management or a kind of post, of, you know, how to post conflict uh, if we bring out the literature of the peace building aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, um, I wanted to say um, that some of different things and um, kind of bring all of them together at the end, but uh, I wanted to um, of scale that uh, you talked about, and I think it's very interesting and very important to know, to know at what scale we are discussing the problem. But um, would it not be necessary to keep in mind that it's really um, a problem at very different scales, and all of them need, need to be addressed, of course, but probably not by the same people? So it's true, and uh, Dr. Madani yesterday mentioned that it's urgent. It's a technical problem. It's dying. It's, it's dead in, I don't know, five years if you don't pay attention to it. But uh, isn't it true that in another sense, this is this late problem is creating a window of opportunity, we can say, for people to talk about the environment? I mean, 
Now it's a crisis and it's immediate because we didn't do the things we had to do 30 years ago or 60 years ago. Uh, I mean, couldn't we um, kind of think of the problem as something long term? It's, it's short term, uh, is the, the short term issues are being addressed by uh, people who need to address them, but why would we try to uh, kind of eliminate that long term aspect of it? When we talk about education, two local people People talked about how education is important, and I have many examples within Iran that um, local people or people from Tehran went somewhere and uh, without any government support or local support tried to change things, and they did it because they uh, began to communicate with people to uh, begin relations to, uh, I mean, one very short example. Uh, the, the cheetah, Iranian cheetah, was being um, extinct a few years ago, and a couple of students from Tehran began talking to people in the areas that kill these animals. And now, it's, now after 15 years, it's in all news, the government is supporting, people are taking care. So it, it's possible and it's done in Iran. I mean, it's not like nothing can be done in Iran. So, so I think, um, especially I think it's also part of what scientists can do is that as they are uh, addressing current issues, immediate issues, urgent issues, uh, keep thinking about how our decisions today impact the future. I mean, if we are um, kind, of, we have um, resource for doing specific issues. So if we have uh, money and we have to put 99% of that money to save the lake today, can't we think of that one remaining person for education, for um, building relations that will be useful in long term? So, so I, I just think that it's also not about uh, just um, the time, it's also about uh, the scale of uh, distance. So it's a local issue, that's right, but then you have a nation state that people in sitting in Tehran maybe never visited the lake. They have feelings about it, they say we want to save it, even if they are not willing to pay the money for it, they, they think about it. And then in a larger scale, we are global citizens, there are environmentalists everywhere in the world and they care about it issues, whether it's in Iran or in India or in the United States. So I think um, while we are zooming in on the current issue, it's good to think about larger processes. And um, and I think um, a part of it is to uh, define knowledge in a broader term. It's, I think I mentioned this yesterday. I, don't, I hope that you don't get bored. But um, it's not about everything that is measurable by, by a meter. It's also about understanding the relations and how um, how um, um, different social groups might change over time. Uh, and I kind of to conclude, I can say that it's really good to look at best things that are done. It's also good to look at worst experiences. So if you're looking at the international community, there are things that worked and there are things that didn't work. And I think it's, hope it's, it's really helpful to um, know about the disasters of ignoring, um, um, I don't know, the, the, the context and um, kind of, um, I don't know, kind of um, thinking about all these processes today. Thanks very much. We're working around, and the end of the time for questions, so Brandon, you're not on me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think one of the major outcomes of this workshop would be to establish collaborations for future. And uh, I believe to facilitate that would be great if we could have more details about the 19 projects that we all were talking about. Of course, not today, but uh, as a follow-up. And uh, so with that, uh, me and other uh, uh, folks here can, uh, could see how they can fit in within those projects. So that would be great if, uh, if there is such a mechanism uh, that you could get what has been done so far, what are the 19 projects, and uh, the details about those projects. So we can see, like, the, uh, the for example, I can examine the sensitivity analysis on different you know, projects, uh, and other people can work on this. That's a very concrete recommendation. I, I don't want to interrupt the speaker, but I, I just to add that this was a start for thinking about Umia Lake and making connection with the U.S. university, especially in my campus, and we need eagerly your help in the future, and it was a start. Thank you. Thank you.
It's good. Yeah, it's a good story. Well, I, I think that everyone in this room knows that this is an uh, interdisciplinary problem. The problem that a lot of these things were saying, not a lot of these things, and a lot of these policy changes and everything. So, the same thing is for the solution. So, we cannot have just one solution to solve everything. Each of us thinks kind of biased towards our background, and biased in good ways. So, it's very relevant to what we study and what we know, and all of these should be seen together. And should be analyzed together so that we can find really the final solution. And I think that Lake Rumi was an opportunity for the water sector about 10, 15 years ago to do a good study, but it has become a risk to the people of the region, a risk of the health, a risk of the job, and everything. So not only we have to understand the risk of the current status of the lake, that it's drying, what is the risk of that? We have to understand the risk of our decision. And if we decide that, let's say, we use the farming and then we use the agricultural lake, tell the farmers to go find another and new job, I'm sure that's not going to work out. And the government should do first build the job and then like present it to the farmer and say, okay, these are the other opportunities. So could you please like stop this use some of the excess of water and then most most of the other sectors? So we have to really understand the risk of the care and status of the lake. And our decision, and only by understanding that we can really understand the effects of our decision, the loss that is uh, kind of exposed to the people who are kind of vulnerable to really that day. I mean, we're sitting here, I mean, we go out and the weather is nice, so we have a lot of water here. I come from California, it's drying. So when I see the uh, ponds, and I just say the ponds are depending on water. So, uh, the thing is that because there are suffering, and we have to be really careful. Part of the job health and whatever. Thank you very much. I have one comment. Uh, today we are going to talk about social economic aspects of the Columbia Lake. But uh, I, I have one comment about this issue. Uh, I think all of us agree with the local stakeholder participation in policy making and decision making. But I believe we should distinguish between two types of local and stakeholder participation. The first one is that uh, we as an engineer, an engineer as an engineer and uh, we made we make a policy and we make a decision in a closed room and after that we are going to uh, educate local people, please follow us. This is the first type of the local participation. But the second part is that you know we uh, and we, the local stakeholders, to be involved in politics. I think when I checked, for instance, the 19th plan for the situation of the Columbia Lake, I sometimes I think that the, the local stakeholder participation in this plan is that we made we made the policy, we made the decision as an engineer, as a official. Then we are going to train and educate local people. Please follow up. I think we cannot say that it's a local stakeholder participation. It's one way. What we need to need to recognize that we cannot restore and we cannot save the Urumia like without local uh, stakeholder participation. But we need to uh, educate them. We agree with, with education in the basic. But we should believe, we should recognize, we should acknowledge that local stakeholder participation is completely different. We, uh, you can see in the face. Thank you.
for me, the more important part is that like a take home message is that I'm more positive than oriented after today. So what 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 I'm really concerned is that uh, instead of focusing actually on solutions, let me just find what the question is in the first place. I, I totally uh, trust and respect the scientists, but what what I'm mentioning here is that uh, we we really need to have a handful of factors that both parties agree upon and then based on that we build up our solution. So uh, it seems that I, I'm I am actually not expecting really what the problem is in the first place. And then the solution there will become stable by uh, we can educate people changing from the agriculture to some other issues. Yeah, big thing. And yet we have a high rate of unemployment in my country and I believe that that is not yeah, uh, I can give you solution for that. So uh, for me, it's kind of apples and oranges at the moment. So I want to clarify something by education. I didn't mean university education. No, no I, I was talking about this point maybe. maybe. So uh, the uh, first point, and I just make a very quick example. In Iran, my cousin some was a serious for the rich people who want just to. Uh, have some idea of like having their hand dirty regarding and stuff like that. And even if you find for those people like the real agriculture, other jobs to do, then they will be still back to their roots to have those agriculture. And as long as they are not educated, they are going to be more serious. You know? So for, for me, uh, this is the, 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 real, the real thing that I very much like to take at, to take at home, uh, like a big home message. Uh, that would be much more fruitful if you know in the first place what the problem is than trying to give a solution where both parties do not really agree on what the problem and the source of the problem are. Thanks very much. Our colleague. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, mention something that I think is important and well, I'm actually. Uh, how to uh, reward the farmers who are now, you know, losing their, you know, some of their uh, crop crops because of the lack of the water. Um, again, I can talk about my family, my experience. Uh, six to seven years ago, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, the vineyard that my family is next to a little uh, village, and the people who are in the village, they own, uh, they, they live actually four seasons in their uh, in their vineyard and orchard. But my family go to the vineyard just during the summer, and um, during the last six years, uh, there was a lot of improvement. Uh, in the area. For example, um, the roads are now paved, which was a new thing. I don't remember. Uh, I remember that when I was a kid, the, the roads were just uh, bumpy and it was just very um, rural ways and we, we had to cover our faces when we were going by car, driving by car to the vineyard. So now they are paved. Uh, there was no electricity six years ago in that region, and uh, we basically were using the, you know, these little lamps, like oil lamps. So nowadays there's electric electricity, people can take their TVs to, this, to their vineyards and their villas, and, and actually village, uh, the rural uh, people and population also are getting also, I heard from my mom this year that uh, the locals can have uh, can go and register for uh, cell phone lines. So, and it is cheaper than uh, you know regular cell phone lines. So, I was thinking that these are kind of uh, improvements, technological improvements, let's say, or urban improvements in the area. What is you know, we use these kind of technological uh, improvements as a reward to farmers who can 
you know, contribute in the in the water policy. But if you avoid them, in that sense. That's a very imaginative idea. Mm -hmm. And now I'd rather shift to your other four main colleagues. Um, yeah. So I think uh, I mentioned some of uh, my but today I have two suggestions for the collaboration and collaboration. I don't really want to make it but today for part of the day. Um, I think one of the collaboration generators or um, collaboration that you want on the event that have is that we are really we don't have that much experiences in uh, making decisions, there is the uh, pattern that comes from uh, bottom to up. We don't have that much um, experience, and whenever we try things, we kind of fail. So now we are facing again this problem. Now it's about farmers, it's about the agreement, and it's about asking them what are they doing. And I think we should learn from. Because we are always uh, making decisions on the top, people don't uh, really get into our equation of decision making, and I think this is one of the issues. The other thing is that, like all of the other governments, uh, the governments of Iran is not professional, the, the resources are limited, so government can't do all the deep stuff. Uh, they should empower NGOs or uh, I don't know any associations which can link government to local people. Somehow we should fill this gap because now it's empty between government and the very um, individual. There is nothing. So I think uh, now there is a problem if you want as an individual or group of people to register your own interest, you should go through all of the safety uh, patterns. Um, it's very difficult to have your own view and you are always um, under the observation if you have your interest. So I think we should um, change the policy a little bit and let people tell us about it. And I have examples. Uh, for example, education and um, trying to put um, women, um, rural women, to help their uh, families to support financially, to keep the, make, uh, helping them to make jobs for themselves and to help financially and support their families. And it's done by NGOs. The wetland issues uh, for emerging wetlands are done by NGOs. Um, I think we can do We should change our view of how NGOs are working. Thank you. There's, there's such a large uh, amount of research both on decision making processes uh, that are for partially or not partially less, and then also a lot of research on the efficacy of NGOs and not that that might be valuable. I'm coming I'm forward. Okay, we have a lot of uh, environmental uh, problems rather than and these things we talk here, uh, such as treatment of the waste water and the use of raw meat, uh, contamination of water with landfills and pesticides, contamination water by nitrate and trace elements. I think we can have shared project about this environmental aspect and uh, giving opportunity for students, especially MSc and PhD students, to have a sabbatical or short-term course or other things in your country, even in, in our countries, for seeing this aspect and environment. So this is my suggestion we can do this type of thing uh, with your universities. It's uh, uh, going to be a big problem in the future. This. Uh, that's a great suggestion. I just found it very ironic, but 
all collapse of um, lake and other human and other um, water body body systems in Iran just came to country that wrong that condition of the time in nineteen thirty one. And Iran is a pioneer for international policy, international law and to make um, international regulation for conservation and sustainable use of wetlands, water systems. And they have a problem in rural like in Shadegan, you know, that other um lakes in Farsh province. But um I think in Iran we don't have uh, the problem of lack of expertise. Um and um maybe the lack of information is meaningful and time saves the other is because of lack of technology. And um we need a full and very active involvement involvement of all parties in Iran, all experts and from and different disciplines in Iran. And also international if we want to have some international uh, involvement and participation um such as as an UNDP as we say the ongoing uh, situation at the moment or WHO unit or other international organizations we need and to have uh, if if we want to transfer all the technologies and information we need to just localize all these technologies to Iran and uh, localization is the most important Ah, thank you. I, I have a few uh, short comments about the solutions that have been proposed here. I guess I would argue against some of them, and it's a clear, uh, of course. The first is this idea of educating people, which I find is very uh, problematic in perspective for, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, having participation, which is inherently a two way street of mutual learning. This is more about learning, not educating local people. Sometimes this is us as practitioners, policy makers, or otherwise, that should be educated by those people. It's not that we should go there and educate people. The second argument is that, of course, information sharing is important, but education or educating people is something else. But the second issue is the idea of transferring from agricultural sector to industrial and industry and or industrial agriculture, which is uh, this transformation is what is transforming water from to today, which is not that much easy to be implemented, and this is not kind of a uh, wide policy to be to lots of religion and ask uh, farmers to change what they are doing and but, but leave the way they need to go and do something else. And the third thing that I want to argue against is this idea of uh, looking or searching for a best or worst practice all around the world, where they have a lot of things inside Iran on which we don't reflect and we don't evaluate them. We have this proverb in Iran, which is kind of related to water also, that says you are, you, you are thirsty and you are looking for water all around the world, while you have this kind of water right inside. I guess it is important to look and to, to see what the other people in other countries, what, what are other they have done in the past, or what are the uh, other experiences all around the world. But I guess more important than that is to evaluate what we have done in the past, specifically in terms of uh, policy for tackling the issue of union. Thank you very much for these provocations, Father. That is excellent. So I think you're next. So I, I go back to our original framing. So the idea of complexity really demands that it so let me see whether I can summarize my understanding. Complexity essentially means tells you that you need to be humble. Humble meaning that I really do not have to do Yesterday, what Suruj was trying to emphasize, I think, is very critical. We are not really here to suggest the truth. And let's be also humble that we are not the decision makers. We may think that we are helping at the most. The decision making will be done really in Iran and at different levels. So, but we, we do recognize that it is a complex problem. So, these complex problems will not have really generalized solutions. If it doesn't really, then it has adaptive solutions. This adaptive solution then has to be built on co learning. I don't talk about educating who is educating whom. I need to be educated more about the lake really by the local people. I can tell them a few things that I have learned from other places, 
So this is an idea of co-learning. What we could do really as a group is to create that process. I, not that we are going to suggest solution. We can suggest that as a solution so when we are taking we will make some recommendation what would be very useful I think if this group as a whole can suggest a process of this co-learning that can happen with some attainable outcome, not just learning, because learning is a very long cycle. It can be 50 years, 100 years. We are not interested in that. There is a long term process. What can we do, do short term? Like what Dinner was saying that what have we done so that we can show that there are certain good things happen? What can be done in next two to three years? What can be done in five to ten years? Then we have something a little bit more useful. Not that those are solvable, not that those are implementable, but at least the discussion can start. To do that, then what I would argue that we focus on those scales and levels. The scale meaning that yes, I think I am with you, Jalari, is scale is no, we should not abandon long term for short term. The challenge is this dichotomy between short and long term is uh, perfect. We know it. That basically what I do today will affect my life 10 years from now. But I am really not that uh, basically foresightful. I cannot see the future, so I keep doing things locally. That will happen. One good example that I found really in climate change or global warming. I may say, but this is uh, it's not my view, but what I will say so it makes it very provocative that I really don't have any interest in the uh, I don't know really when they will be born. I, I want to really maximize my comfort. But you want me to basically not drive a hammer because I like hammer. And by creating hammer, I'm creating global warming. So what can be done? This is a concept. We talk about transgenerational liquidity. These are good abstract concepts, but there's no meaning. But one person got it very right. The way it was done is this. If, for example, reducing air pollution in Boston right now is affecting me, it will also have the next generation. So that means if I can create certain things, those interventions can rightfully affect me, so that's my gain. At the same time, it also affects the future. Then only we have found something to link short term and long term. What we are looking for this basically, yesterday we talked about this. I'm still not convinced really that Urmia Lake has any value for many people. Yeah, it was a nice thing to do. I right? was so even when then I did this. What is the real benefit? It's not clear. If that is not even clear, how can we talk about this if you put in value to that? So this is very problematic. Forget about short and long term. So that means we need to understand that. That's where I think this idea of Austin would be very powerful. How do you connect then constitutional rules, collective choice rules, and operational rules? If you can do all these three together and create a process of that conversation that can go on, I think we've done something at least humble but effective. I think if you have three more questions or uh, comments, and then I think you come to a good uh, conclusion. So we're swinging back, and then it's going to swing back around this way. I think you're the last and clockwise. I'm going to try to summarize what I have heard. Uh, I think what I have heard is that collectively we would like to keep up the discussion related to the reframing of the issues. And to this extent, I think we would like to maintain international collaboration around Lake Ermier, and maybe even including expertise from Lake Aral or the Aral Sea. Um, maybe we could also, to this extent, create a formal academic exchange between our institutions. That would be really nice. Uh, and then I heard that we would really like to continue to per perform analysis related to economics, agriculture, institutions, stakeholder engagement, keeping scale in mind, and also perform a social network analysis, I think. I, that wasn't said directly, but I think it sort of came out. Think and pay special attention to connections between the different realms and adaptive solutions. That's very well. Thank you very much for that summary. Number. And I can send that to you. <laughs> yeah, of course, I said, uh, 
position on trade-off between equity and uh, uh, efficiency. I never made such a comment. I don't think it was part of my discussion. What I was trying to say, I, was on, I wanted to re-emphasize, is the trade-off between different source of restoration and different benefits of scale of restoration. And we cannot forget this hard constraint. The water should come from certain places. Wherever you take this water... Hamid, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Ahmed, can you hear me? Should I? Did you guys hear me, or should I should repeat it? I I can hear, but I'm not sure that the other. Okay. Should I go on? Ahmed, before no, no, continue. Okay. Um, what I was going to suggest, uh, which was I think following what Puriya was saying, I think we need to come up with a taxonomy of. The yeah, scale of different solutions. I heard very nice comments about educating people, about building social groups. These are all great. I, we know that they have worked well in small scale, you know, community levels. But here our problem is a bit different. The problem is bringing close to a million uh, cubic meter of water per year. And we have to see where are the, like the 80% of the volume can, can come. Um, uh, if you can come up with this ABC uh, categorization and associate a cost with each of them, then we can rule out certain infeasible solutions. For instance, Mehdiz Algami, I guess, was telling that we should create the, the jobs. So I did a back of envelope calculation. We are talking about 500,000 farmers. Let's say that you want to cut employment for half of them. That's 250,000. Nice. The entire country didn't achieve creating 250,000 jobs during the last year. And during the last decade, we didn't manage to create more than 500,000 new jobs. So we have to sort of compare the scale of the solutions we are proposing with the entire capacity of the country. It's always nice to be creative and 
think out of the box, etc. But at the same time, I think the resource constraint gives us certain hard constraint that it's not easy to pass over. And my final comment, um, I think one of the issues that many people pointed out is this fragmented small scale farming. That's a big barrier for multiple solutions. It's a big barrier for diffusion of the new water solutions. It creates the free riding problem. It creates the issue of the, the metering. And also it reduces the internalization of the effect of crisis on individual farmer. When you own just a small piece of land, you don't care about the regional effect. If you own hundreds of acres of land, then you would care because there would be a direct impact on your uh, the ownership. One strategy would be to start uh, activities to accumulate land tenure. Uh, I didn't see part of the solutions. The government can encourage large agricultural investment corporations to come negotiate with farmers and try to aggregate pieces of land. Once we reduce the number of 500,000 small-scale farmers, maybe to a couple of 10 large corporations, then it would be much easier to bring everybody around the table because they would have large scales in rescuing the, uh, uh, the lake and also they would have enough resources to invest on uh, real, uh, new technologies. I think that's all I want to say. And thank you so much. It was a wonderful opportunity to be you with guys. Since I cannot say goodbye, I just finish here and I uh, wish all the best for everybody. Biology or ecology under the ground supports the plants and the growth of the plants. So that's just it's something I really haven't heard is, is considering the ecology as a stakeholder as well in the environment. Uh, consider them as stakeholders. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to add that I also agree that because there's a state holder, there's a lake basin and who plays a huge role to help divert water from lake for input. And also, this is about what is a source of income, uh, such as health, health hazard from that system. As I know from Arachi, it's a really, really disaster for all control region, region, and it goes parallel. So it's impact on our health. I think most of the more than million people there. And I'm reading a survey from around the but this face is all around. So that is just about also about health issues for people who live around this place. And I don't think so that only people who live in this place then they impact I think it's survey for all around. Impact from that is the only thing that is going to be And I think that we want to be able 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 to Policymakers, they should move from, I say, ribbon cutting solutions to long term, but not so visible solutions. They should sacrifice their high prestige in the people and uh, go from ribbon cutting solutions to more uh, actionable solutions. And from the people side, the people also should not wait for the government. The people also should start making uh, small institutions between them. That we, historically, we have something like that. We have Mirab, that you know about the history of Iran. The people themselves organize what to use it. And also, regarding the religious issues, we have pay acts that people themselves collaborate and start some work. Then from the people's side, 
they should not wait for the government and their policy. And then we should move from the full side to find actionable solutions. Thank you.
use travel time you have there, and also making that simple. I mean, giving a information about the label and a very nice presentation. And also, wish you a very safe trip back home. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, again, I just want to invite you all for the lunch outside in the hallway. Uh, other than that, I mean, have a very good weekend. And all that was just to take a picture. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to the very time. And a uh, very happy conference. <laughs> I just want to say one more thing. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much for reminding me about this. Yes, thank you. But one thing I will say though, from the next time, I will say that this is a lot. Give me one minute. Hello. Hello. Give me one minute. So, now one way to measure really that what we have done, there is a group really in international development. They came up with something called a significant change. So this is not about numbers, not about analysis. When you have a process like this, you may feel good that yeah, we have spent one day at us, one day at MIT, with a lot of discussion, and we feel good. And six months from now, you have forgotten everything that has been discussed. So this is not a significant change. What I would ask us to do really is do something actionable, so that once we get out of here, at least do one thing that will have some impact six months or 12 months from now, whatever it is. You can do it individually, you can do it as a book. What I and Mahdi and Hotchak will probably do, we will try to synthesize some of these things and try to write something up. And we need to also survey and to and perhaps write two pages, a summary that can go to the newspaper or to even Iran, at least what we have discussed. After that, I think it is our own responsibility to do something that is actionable on our own part. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, only thing is, is that with Michael's notes here, you'll actually have a, a basis for uh, compiling this summary. And uh, and so that really everyone, most of what contributed to those notes, and you really have a lot to work with. I just wanted to add that basically uh, our group policy is actually we gener have generated reports in the past and basically since policy making and bridging the gap, since you are giving uh, policy making is one of our basic constitutional uh, roles, we will certainly push for that and we will share the results with everybody here. I also want to thank our online participants.